Good afternoon. Welcome to EduSet Network. Friend, you know we are discussing rural development and in the last lecture we tried to understand meaning, concept and various objectives and how it has been uh, taken up in different uh, uh, plan. Today we will move to the different issues that uh, that is related to the rural de uh, development like uh, unemployment, poverty, etc. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio the same resource person, uh, Dr. Ajmer Singh Malik. He is a senior academician and over 25 years teaching experience earns and presently he is a professor of public administration in Kurukshetra University. And Dr. Malik has written three books, uh, Rural Industrialization, Rural Le Leadership and socio-economic uh, development of scheduled caste in Haryana and a number of articles published in different national and international journals. And uh, Dr. Malik is also editor of a journal uh, on public uh, affairs and governance. So certainly his knowledge and experience will help us to understand this topic and give insight how to understand the issues related to uh, rural development. So on your behalf, I welcome him for the EduSet lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you. As uh, Mr. Ambendra Kumar has told that today we will discuss rural de development issues in governance. So, rural development issues in governance, first of all, let's uh, have a somewhat, some brief backgrounds related to the rural development and the historical background. Uh, that is, uh, rural development is not an idea which was unknown in the past. In real sense, if say, uh, if you see, this process hal has always been a part of our culture and tradition, but its contents and forms have been different in different time periods and areas of the country also. The concept of rural development as we discussed yesterday has changed with the change of needs, aspirations and values of the society and consequent interactions of the concerned community. Therefore, it depends upon many factors that what is rural development, what is the need of the development that depends on many factors and as we stated in the last lecture that it is a very complex process or complex phenomena, uh, complex phenomena and many, many kind of the actors, uh, many kinds of the agencies and actors interact uh, in ensuring rural development. Moreover, uh, the rural development, besides the governing institutions which are undertaking this process, there is a significant role of technology as well as of the strategies, means and methods and all these things, that is the governing institution and uh, technologies and strategies, means and methods that uh, try, to, try to ensure progress either by, a com by, by the community itself or uh, these uh, technologies, strategies and means and methods are borrowed from other advanced societies or communities and all these things, not only deciding the objective of rural development, rather those are influencing the process, means, methods and technology as well as the outcomes also of the rural development process. The question is uh, that uh, how this has been taking place or how uh, we, uh, we can say the rural development is, uh, uh, is being influenced by the governing institution, technology, etc. This, is a, the, uh, this depends upon the time period, this depends upon the issues associated with the rural development. Therefore, uh, since this is the uh, foundation, uh, since th th this is the foundation lecture, that's why uh, uh, we have selected the important issues relating to the process of the rural development, particularly with reference to India. And these issues are, let's summarize these issues, and these issues are number one, rural poverty, number two, rural employment, number three, rural li livelihood, number four, social assistance, Number five, people participations and their empowerment. Uh, number six, urban dimensions. Number seven, land policy and land acquisitions. Number eight, infrastructure development. Number nine, differently able persons living in rural areas definitely. And greening of rural development, this is the new area which is emerging particularly in India and keeping in view the need of the sustainable development. So we will discuss all these aspects one by one and first of all the most important area that is the rural poverty. Uh, if you define the poverty, 
poverty is un, uh, is an unacceptable human condition that does not have uh, to be inevitable the main goal of the development is to eliminate poverty and to reduce social imbalances existing in the society elimination of poverty increase people participation in production system and decision making process of the community naturally if there is an elimination of poverty from the society it leads to the uh, it leads to the uh, leads it improves the quality of life this is very important one if a society is composed of the poor people naturally the life of the people in that community may not be uh, considered to be prosperous and it may not be happy life poverty again like the rural development process is a multidimensional process and have economic social and governance perspectives it not only indicates lesser income level of the individual but also reflect possession of lesser resources and lesser opportunities planning commission has pointed out that there is high concentration of poor people poor people in the rural areas of the country and about 75% of the total poor live there in villages means uh, about 3/4 of the popul 3/4 of the population living below the below poverty line that's uh, that that is there in the villages of the country moreover their proportion their means the poor people's proportion is found to be higher among scheduled caste scheduled tribes and weaker section of the society the poverty does not only create the problem of wastage of human resources but also brings many kinds of social economic and cultural problems uh generally it is considered growth with social justice and inclusive gro- growth have been made the basic objective of the development planning in india since its independence as for example we can say ki efforts have been made during 1950s and 1960s to improve the conditions of poor by introducing certain reforms those were relating to the land la- land holdings or land reforms etc during 1970s and 1980s it was witnessed that the implementation of, uh, the the period witnessed the implementation of various poverty alleviation programs naturally in 1980 irdp uh, the irdp was there that was introduced or we can say that the irdp which is a target group oriented approach wa and national rural employment program were introduced uh for the elimination of poverty or for the uh, we say for alleviating the poverty from the society the objective of irdp and national rural employment program uh, was to create employment opportunity for the poor and distributing renewable assets in order to get them outside the poverty net the question is the basic purpose due from 1950 to 1980 the government of india along with the state governments made serious attempt made serious attempt and many kinds of the programs by making certain reforms in the uh, in the governance of the rural areas as well as by uh, by creating some uh, by crea- by formulating the programs so that the employment opportunity may be provided to the people living in the rural areas and out of that employment they may uh, they, they may come out of the poverty net this kind of the programs were no doubt made during that period and in 1980 with the launching of irdp program and national rural employment program this was made a sincere and systematic efforts at the government of india level uh the uh, uh i will say the usually the target oriented approach which was introduced through the irdp and a little bit structural changes during the period were intended to create an environment for ensuring a spread effect of overall economic growth what it means that the government wanted 
that there must be overall economic development in the country and out of uh, the result of that economic development may also percolate or s there may be a spread effect of overall economic growth on the poor also. They may also get benefited uh, out of it, although it could not bring the desired result. But that was the best approach at that time uh, that was utilized by the government to eliminate the poverty from the rural area. Moreover, at that time, the dominant thought was to create more wealth to enable the poor to benefit from the secondary effects of growth presumed to percolate down to reach the poor. In simple sense, again, I say that the economic development as a whole may bring certain benefits to the rural poor also. That was the philosophy behind it. Many anti-poverty programs under the five-year plans were introduced, as we stated, let's, let's list them out because it may not be possible within this lecture uh, to, to elaborate all those programs, but at least we can name them, we can list them so that, uh, the, uh, we, say, so that uh, we can understand how the anti-poverty uh, poverty programs were undertaken in the country. We start with the first important program, IRDP that was uh, under this program, Sarvan Janti Gram Savrozgar Yojana, SGSY, popularly known as that was introduced, it was employment oriented program. Similarly, there was another program which was wage employment program like JRY, JGSY, JRY means Jawahar Rozgar Yojana, JGSY means Jawahar Gramin Savrozgar Yojana, employment assurance scheme, Food for Work Program and Savan Janti Gramin Rozgar Yojana as we stated earlier also that was wage employment program. The basic purpose was to provide employment or to increase the income level particularly during the lean seasons when the employment opportunities are not available in the agriculture sector uh, keeping in view all these things that some sort of employment opportunities needs to be created and those were created by these different schemes. There is another program which was started in 1985-86, we will discuss a little bit about it later on also, that is the rural housing. The fourth program is social security programs under the national social assistance programs, we will discuss something about it in the, uh, ahead in the lecture also. But it consists of, at this point of time, I say it consists of three components. One is National Old Age Pension Scheme. The second was National Benefit, uh, National Family Benefit Scheme. And the third is National Maternity Benefit Schemes. Uh, these are the three uh, assist, social assistance programs which were introduced and which were also a direct attack on the poverty. All these programs which I am stating now, those are anti-poverty programs, those were to assist the poor people so that they may, they, they may lead a qualitative life, so that they may come out of the uh, net of the, uh, come out of the vicious circle of the poverty, that is important. Certain land reforms were also introduced, we will discuss all about it in the, uh, we say under the separate heading, public distribution system is there, that is relating to the food security, which now uh, converted into the food security. There were certain education program that was operation, uh, operation blackboard was there, DPP district primary education pro, uh, education project, midday meal scheme is there, serve six avian is there and ultimately it is converted now into the fundamental right that is right to education. Then another program was ICDS that is Integrated Child Development Services and it was started in the year 1975 that was for the ch health of the children that is for that. But in spite of all efforts, as I already said, the situation is so grim and uh, we say uh, so grim that we could not ameliorate the condition or we could not alleviate the poverty from the rural society. Therefore, more efforts are required in this direction and this is the uh, poverty, rural poverty has become a major issue of the rural development. Naturally, so many research, so many 
uh, we said the budgetary provision or budgetary allocations have been made and a gigantic administrative setup has uh, is uh, has been engaged to to work against this poverty but still we could not get the desired result and that's why this is an important area of the rural development or important issue of the rural development then the second issue is relating to the uh, uh, second issue is rural employment as we stated in the rural poverty also that the rural poverty can be eliminated only th through the provision of employment opportunity to the people living in the villages therefore we say uh, why why rural employment is so important why it is required the question is most of the poor majority of poor in rural areas mainly depend upon the wages they earn through unskilled labor means they don't have any skill and that's why they may not be able to get the employment hence they are always on the threshold level of subsistence and they are prone to to fall below the poverty level whenever there is inadequate demand of labor or crisis in other words we can say that since the most majority of the poor in rural areas are unskilled they are not getting any job only the manual job manual kind of unemployment and when they are getting the manual kind of unemployment suppose there is some sort of crisis our we say there is inadequate demand of labor particularly during the natural disasters etc or do uh, we say in such a situation they may not get the employment and they will fall below the poverty line many times what happens that there may be ill health of the concerned individual concerned poor person and in case he is suffering from some disease or some ill health problem then in that circumstances he may not be able to earn the wages so uh, therefore the wage employment program were launched by the government of india since 1961 and uh, we say uh, as we discussed our earlier also under the anti poverty programs or we say rural uh, uh, poverty programs that these were the programs which were started uh, since the beginning and uh, beginning of our five year plans uh, yeah the, uh, five year plans or planned economic growth era we started with that the program relating to rural employment introduced by the government of india if you take it in a historical manner first of all in 1960 61 rural manpower program was uh, uh, started thereafter in 1971-72 crash scheme for rural employment that was introduced in number 3 drought prone area program was introduced during the 70s similarly small farmers development agency that was also the 1970s marginal farm and agriculture labor scheme uh, that was all these programs our relating to certain class of people or certain class uh, certain sections of the rural society as for example we say the drought prone area program was meant for those uh, for those areas which are prone to the drought similarly small farmers development agency was for those to assist the small farmers and marginal farmers again agriculture labor scheme that was meant for only a class of citizens relating to that particular scheme in 1977 all these schemes all these five schemes were recreated as food for work program means anyone who is putting some labor since he was skilled that was engaged in some sort of employment that is the wage employment and that scheme was known as the food for work program the naturally as the name suggest that it was not uh, the labor was not paid in in terms of the money it was also paid in terms of the in terms of food that is uh, we say grain or cereals for that purpose it depends upon from state to state what kind of the need of those particular people poor people was there and accordingly they were compensated with that kind of the uh, we say that kind of grains then another this food for program was streamlined as nrep 
that is National Rural Employment Program as we stated earlier in 1980. And another program, Rural Landless Employment Guarantee, uh, Guarantee Program was started, means Food for Work Program was streamlined as NREP and it was again as RLEGP, Rural Landless Employment Guarantee Program. Thereafter, in 93-94, these programs, employment programs were uh, further streamlined as Jawar Rozgar Yojana, JRY, and Employment Assurance Scheme. And thereafter, <coughs> but again, there were certain improvements keeping new the needs of the poor people, and JRY, Jawar Rozgar Yojana, was must with Jawar Gram Samridhi Yojana means it was relating to the infrastructural development programs uh, that was launched uh, by the government to be created in the rural areas of the country and uh, from 1990 to 2000 and made as a rural infrastructure program as I stated to you as earlier. <coughs> JGSY was merged with another uh, uh, Yojana that is Sampuran Gram Ra uh, Rozgar Yojana, SGRY, in 2001-2 and National Food for Work Program in 2005. Means all these programs, all these schemes or all these Yojana were only intended to generate employment activities and through the generation of employment and uh, employment opportunities, the income level of the poor people may be increased otherwise they will face the economic crisis and that may, uh, that may not be possible to lead a qualitative life in the rural areas. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, that kind of the program. Based on the experiences of all these schemes, including all these schemes which we have discussed, uh, on that experience, Manrega, which is, uh, uh, that was an act, uh, Manrega, that is an act, that is to provide a guarantee to provide employment opportunity of 100 days to those who are unskilled and that is the manual labor on September 5th, 2005 and it was launched on February 2nd, 2006. Manrega has a potential of generating a large volume of manual employment for unskilled workers in the Indian villages. The potential is evident from the fact that about 4.16 crore mandates of labor was generated in a single year 2012-13. This is the volume of employment, uh, that is the volume of employment generated and naturally you can imagine how many people or how many poor people could get benefited out of this scheme, out of this Manrega. This is that kind of, it is, it is said that this is the biggest employment generate uh, ge ge employment generation program uh, 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 introduced in anywhere in the world this is that kind of the uh, uh, this is of that volume then the third issue uh, we say again uh, if we see rural poverty and the rural employment those are no doubt interrelated to each other but uh, over the years the government has uh, gained some experiences by implementing employment program and out of that program it could uh, it could bring out Manrega that is a, in the form of an enactment. It is a an enactment not only in a Yojana like or the schemes like the earlier one and uh, uh, it was a guarantee and if a person is not able to get employment uh, during the lean season or whenever they demand as per the rules and regulations framed under the Manrega uh, then in that circumstances they can demand it and government has to compensate if it is unable to uh, or government or any other agencies on the on behalf of the government which is implementing it they, they have to pay they have to compensate uh, the job seekers under the Manrega that is that kind of the guarantee and it has been considered one of the biggest achievement of UPA government. Then the third issue which is relating to, which is also equally imp important is rural livelihood. That is planning commission in the year 1997 constituted a committee under the chairmanship of Professor S.R. Hasim 
to review and rationalize various central sponsored schemes for our poverty alleviation and employment generation we discussed earlier. These schemes particularly these are the schemes are centrally sponsored in the sense that budgetary provisions are made by the central government and those are formulated by the central government. Those are implemented in the state and the state agencies are there. But the central governments monitor all those schemes. And naturally a large amount of budget, large budgetary allocations were made to implement these schemes. Therefore, the government of India wanted to review it and that is why it constituted a committee and that committee was under the chairmanship of Professor S. R. Hasim. The committee recommended the integration of allied programs with IRDP. Means that all the allied programs which are relating to the wage employment or poverty elevation programs, those must be, uh, those are allied to the RDP, those should be integrated with IRDP. It was a shift from individual beneficiary approach to group approach for poverty elevation with self-help group of rural BPL as a unit of assistance. This is a paradigm shift in real sense. Earlier, earlier to this one, earlier to the rural livelihood, the individual family or individual person who is poor that has to be assisted with financial assistance, with subsidy or they, they, they are provided as, uh, as uh, they are uh, they they are considered as the beneficiary. Individual person is considered as the beneficiary under the central sponsored scheme. But uh, nature, but that was not bringing the desired results, and that's why, uh, particularly in the sense that the, the those schemes could not empower, those schemes could not empower the people or the poor people of the villages. And moreover, that benefit generated from those schemes, those were not, uh, uh, those were not having desirable level of the sustenance or we can say sustainable, uh, sustainable gains were not made by the individual beneficiary under those uh, centrally sponsored schemes relating to the wage employment or the poverty elevation. That is why this committee suggested that it should, there should be a shift from individual beneficiary scheme to group approach of the poverty elevation means a group of persons that is self-help group particularly nowadays it is um, of the women that has been made, they, they, ha they are guided, consulted and they start an activity and uh, they, they, they also uh, contribute towards toward the financial resources of, for that activity, naturally depending upon the financial contribution of the members of the uh, self-help group, the bank, bank credit is also made available under the scheme. There is a detailed program, but here we are concerned that instead of helping one, instead of benefiting one individual as a beneficiary, we, that shift was made under the rural livelihood scheme that it should be a group of people that should be from 10 to 20 people having a SHG, they start an economic micro enterprise and out of the benefit, they keep it for the crisis, uh, reserve, uh, reserve financial resources as well as they distribute, uh, they, they divide them. Moreover, they are not uh, the, that they are, uh, that uh, even for the consumption uh, purposes, the members of the self-help groups may get credit out from the SHG itself. Means they are acting as the bank for the members, so that the small needs, small financial needs, can be meet out uh, from from their own resources, and that is there. It was in real sense there were many schemes. That is, Trisem was there, Sitara was there, GKY was there, Davakra was there, MWS was there, and those were uh, those schemes, uh, those were, uh, we say, <coughs> streamlined as seven Jati grams of Rozgar Yojana uh, and implemented from 1999. And objective of G as GY were to improve family income by sustainable income generation through micro enterprise development and coordinating with the capacity building of the poor, credit availability, technology transfer, marketing and infrastructure. Based on the evaluation and performance of the scheme, uh, we say that a 
Radha Kirsan committee recommended the structure, restructure of this SGI, some, uh, that is Sampuran Gramin Savrozgar Yojana as National Rural Livelihood Mission. Means there are two committees, one is the Hasim committee, another is Radha Kirsan committee. Hasim committee suggested that the, there should be a paradigm shift in assisting the individual beneficiary to the group. Uh, group uh, oriented approach must be adopted. Radha Garson committee, which uh, we say that state that the uh, uh, that uh, SGSY should be taken as the National Rural Livelihood Mission and it is renamed as Ajivka and it was launched in the year 2011. Like Mandrega, this scheme that is employment oriented scheme, it is known as the Ajivka or National Rural Livelihood Mission that, that, that is based on three pillars. And what are those three pillars? Number one, it enhances uh, and expands the existing livelihood options for the poor. Means they may be able, there must be enhancement as well as expansions of the employment opportunity from where they can get their livelihood. The second is building skills for the job market outside. That the person who are the members of the SHG, they they should not be uh, they they should not act as the unskilled person. Rather, they should develop. They should be trained uh, trained in certain skills so that they can produce for the mass consumption at least uh, for, for the society living around them. So that they can get benefit or so that they can market their products without skill it may not be possible that they may generate a sust uh, generate an income for themselves on sustainable basis it may not be possible and third thing is nurturing self employment and entrepreneurs that they must act as the self employment for people they should not be dependent Rather, we say, uh, they should not say that they will work for someone else and get the wages from there. It may not be feasible because on again, as we stated earlier, based on the crisis, during the crisis, they will not get the employment and there is, there is uh, all chances that they may, uh, they, they may be prone to uh, fall below the poverty line. And that's why they should act as the entrepreneurs. They should be able to take the risk. They should be able to make so, some sort of investment and out of that investment, they may be able to get benefited. That will empower them. That will motivate them. These are the three pillars. Means enhancing and expanding the existing livelihood options of, for the poor, of the poor. Second, building skill for the job market outside and nurturing self-employment, employed and entrepreneurs, that's, that is the basic. The studies conducted to examine the performance also indicate that the self-help groups has become an instrument of social and economic empowerment of rural people. I do agree that this kind of the missions, that is self-help group mission is not present everywhere. I do agree that there may be misuse of this kind of the scheme by someone, but in most part of the India, SHG particularly the poor and among women, it has become an instrument of social and economic empowerment of the rural paper. The reason being they are acting as, as, the, uh, acting as entrepreneur, they are skilled one, they are producing something for the nearby market, they are selling it and they, they are having the confidence. They have some sort of recognition and they are managing the affairs of their micro enterprises themselves. Moreover, they are living the shared life. They are sharing the sorrows, they are sharing the happiness, they are sharing uh, the financial resources available to their, um, their own SHGs. This is why it is termed as social and economic empowerment of the rural power. power. It is despite uh, as I have already stated, despite the uneven formation of SHG across the states. The reason is, uh, we say that uh, uh, everyone is not uh, ready to accept this kind of philosophy uh, since we have, uh, we have diversity of the people and their needs are also diverse when the, in such a circumstances it may not be possible that there may be uniformity uh, of this kind all over the country. But 
there are certain problems in self-help group which is creating uh, problems for the implementation of uh, SGRY as well as uh, we say and that is the National Rural Livelihood Mission and those are that there is insufficient capacity building. The question is that the people who are engaged in this kind of activities that they may not be very much empowered are particularly to compete with the lock, uh, to compete with the market forces. The second is there is a low credit mobilization. The SHG are formed by the poor people. They do not have enough resources, financial resources. And since they do not have enough financial resources, that's why they are unable to mobilize the credit for themselves. The reason is that there is a fixed amount that first of all, the members have to mobilize their own resources and on the basis of the, uh, on the, basis of the amount mobilized by them, uh, the bank credit is available. Moreover, bank credit is available on the performance of the SHG. Uh, the, in the initial years when it was incepted, uh, there were, uh, when the SHG, was, uh, SHG is started, at that time they do not have that kind of the financial strength, although they need it most at that time. The third is the lack of dedicated professionals. Generally it is said that the government officials or the volunteer organizations will motivate them. but usually we find uh, there is a lack of motivated or dedicated professionals to help the poor people in this regard. That's why it could not get the desired results. But uh, we say we should not be pessimistic. We must be optimistic about it. And whatever, if we, say, if we look at the success story of some of the SHG, then those are going and doing wonders also. Then next issue. That again, before uh, taking up the next issue, I again remind you that uh, the issues which is national rural livelihood, how to generate employment opportunity, how to make the life of the people uh, reasonable, uh, uh, of reasonable level, uh, we say uh, even at the mainstream level, how to, uh, how to motivate them, how to develop the entrepreneurship or how to develop their capacity so that they, com they can compete in the modern days, that kind of challenge is a challenge for the rural development also. Uh, we should not stick to, to the traditional rural development practices, rather we should take up the things which are which are coming to us as a challenge and naturally we have to devise the strategy in such a manner so that we can counter those things in a right way. Now, the another important thing is that we have discussed about the economic aspect among the rural poverty, rural employment and then uh, the national rural, uh, rural livelihood. Now, about the social welfare also, that's, a, that's an important area uh, for the poor people of the villages, particularly for the poor people of the villages. If you see, the social fabric is disintegrating and community health is not there, particularly in the social welfare aspect that's missing nowadays. We are, and therefore, although uh, that, that was there in the traditional society, but now we are not living in a traditional society, even in the rural areas. It has changed. No doubt there are certain areas which are inaccessible, one, and they are traditional. They are traditional, they are an outlook, but in socially they are not termed as just, uh, traditional nowadays because of many kinds of region which is outside the scope of this lecture. The social assistance particularly that has to be provided by the state. Our constitutional framers were well aware of it and that's why they inserted an article 41 in the directive principles of state policy. And as per the language of the article 41, it directs the state to provide public assistance to its citizens in case of unemployment, old age, underline it that the citizen in case of unemployment, old age, sickness and disablement and in other cases of undeserved want within the limits of economic capacity and development means that social assistance can be provided if the state has enough resources for assisting the people. Moreover, 
The assistance is provided in case of unemployment, in case of old age, in case of sickness, in case of disablement and in case of in cases of undeserved want that is which is not uh, expected and that is why in case of the crisis uh, we will discuss that aspect. Hence, budgetary provision was made for national social, social assistance programs in its by the government of India in its central budget for 95-96. In other way, we can say the government of India or the state governments could not take up the social assistance programs till 95-96. The reason being that it may not have neither the will nor the budgetary uh, provision with it or the financial uh, we say economic position was not well off. But rather if you say uh, that after the introduction of economic liberalization when we exposed ourselves to the world that when we open up in that circumstances many kinds of the agencies that started to uh, started uh, uh, taking interest in the rural development international agencies and they motivated they pressurized or they mobilized the spot in favor of certain social assistance program earlier it was considered the philosophy was very simple that this kind of the activities will be taken up in the traditional society by the community itself that was the but at the time particularly at the time of independence and particularly uh, when it was not so required at that time it was well attended by the community also. But now in a modern sense, in a modern society or in, a mo in the changed circumstances, we say this kind of the social assistance as per the provision of article 41 of the constitution that government of India has also started certain scheme. Uh, there were certain schemes earlier also that their quantum or their impact was very minimal one. And nowadays that this social assistance scheme as we discussed earlier, it composed of three important schemes. One is national old age, old age pension, that pension is given to the old person, uh, particularly uh, we say uh, the senior citizen, earlier the age limit was 65, now it is 60. In real sense, although it was started in 1964, but uh, we say in Haryana, uh, one of the chief ministers, Chaudhary Devilal, that has revolutionized the old age pension scheme. He called it as a summon to the elder person of the society and that is in real sense of great help or great social assistance, particularly to the poor people. What is the difference between that scheme and this scheme is this uh, the beneficiary under the national old age pension scheme is uh, pension scheme is a poor person whereas in case of Haryana state it is available to all. This is the basic difference moreover the state government ha many state governments have started to fund uh, the uh, old age pension scheme although the money or the uh, we say the amount of money which is paid that is not a very very higher one, but it is a sufficient also. As for example, in case of national old age pension scheme, it is rupees 500 uh, per person or per, uh, per person in uh, uh, we say uh, uh, per month. So similarly, there is another national social assistance scheme that is the national family benefit scheme. And it, it is again for the BPL family and in case of death of the primary breadwinner. This is again a very, very important one. There is a crisis, particularly if we say uh, that crop failure was there, there was only one breadwinner, there is unorganized sector also, particularly who do not have any kind of the resources for sustaining the family, only the breadwinner, uh, he died, he, he or she died. In that situation, there is a scheme that the family is assisted under the National Family Benefit Scheme. Again, the only it is admissible only to uh, the uh, BPL families and the amount is not a very uh, very, uh, very very we say uh, it is a very subsistence amount is paid under it uh, it requires to be revised but again it depends upon the economic or the financial position of the country the third scheme is national maternity benefit scheme national maternity benefit scheme uh, now it is transferred from 2001 to 202. It is, it is transferred to the uh, term, 
uh, a Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and it is uh, a, an assistance provided at the time of the birth of the child. This is for that purpose. These were the three basic assistance, social assistance scheme. But there are certain other schemes also which are added to the social assistance, and these are Anapurna scheme for providing the food security. And as a result of it, many political parties have promised subsidized uh, food grains to the uh, maybe the Chhattisgarh, maybe the uh, we say Tamil Nadu, maybe the uh, we say uh, many poor states, and uh, they started that the poor may get even not poor states, everyone is uh, doing it. And the government of India has also launched uh, the food security scheme. Uh, because of this Anpurna scheme, uh, it is a streamlined scheme, uh, Anpurna scheme that was started or launched on 1st April 2000. Similarly, there was another scheme which was added to the social assistance scheme that is Indira Gandhi National Widow Pension Scheme. It is, as the name suggests, admissible to the widow, uh, or widow um, if the husband dies only in that circumstances that is. Uh, in some and states are also contributing to it and the amount is amount varies with the state to state and naturally there is uh, we say uh, assistance from the government of India as well as the state government and the third scheme is Indira Gandhi National Disability Pension Scheme that was also started under the National Social Assistance Programs means there were three schemes three more were added and even some of the schemes which were added those were streamlined in the uh, in, in, in larger programs and uh, there is one more program that is Indra Avas Yojana. Indra Avas Yojana is a very successful scheme. In real sense uh, we have not discussed it uh, till now as a part of the social assistance scheme. The reason is that it was started as an employment generation program under National Rural Employment Program in 1980. Means at the time we launched in IRDP, National Rural Employment Program was introduced and for generating or for creating employment opportunity in rural areas, the government has started that the houses may be constructed for the poor and that may generate the employment opportunity. As a result of that, it is not considered, uh, it was not considered as a social assistance scheme. But housing is in real sense is a basic human needs and a right to procure house is considered as a human right. It is considered as a human right now. It was started uh, as, as uh, we say, uh, that is, and that's why nowadays Indra Avas Yojana, that is to provide housing to those who, 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 who does not have any house. It means that is a social assistance. That is, there are so many things associated with the house. The question is family has some sort of privacy, family has some sort of respect, some sort of uh, being social. That is, they are part of that community. That's why this kind of the scheme is also part of the National Social Assistance Program. And that's why all these things which have been discussed, whether it may be relating to the old age pension, whether it may be relating to the family benefit scheme, whether it may be relating to the widow pension scheme, whether it may be relating to the food security, whether it may be relating to the housing, all these areas are very important and very crucial for the rural development activities. If those are not undertaken in the right way, then we cannot say there is no meaningful rural development in the country. And that's why the, these are essentially required that not only the employment or the removal of poverty is essential, rather this kind of the social assistance being the social welfare state, it is also essential. No doubt the provision has been made in the directive principle of the state policy, but mere, merely, uh, but it does not mean that the state does not have any responsibility. As for example, Bharat Nirman program, Indra Avas Yojana, Housing Avas Yojana is a part of that program. So in, in such a program, so that's why this is, this is a crucial and very significant issue relating to the uh, rural development. Then next issue is, that is the people participation and their empowerment. This is again a very, very important area 
this is again a very major area like the rural poverty, rural employment and this is another important. If we say and it is a very every person who is speaking on the rural development, he will speak on the community, community development program. That was started with the objective to obtain people participation in the rural development and that was not materialized. Community development was uh, that objective to ensure people participation that could not be materialized. Balwantrai Mehta committee was appointed how to ensure people participation. It naturally the recommendation paved the way for the democratic decentralization in the country. Panchayat Raj system, three tier Panchayat Raj system was recommended. And whatever is there, I am not since again it is outside the scope of this lecture that Panchayat Raj, how much it is successful, how much it is not successful. But whatever is here, the question is that democratic decentralization introduced in the country that has been able to provide a rural leadership in the country. And that rural leadership acted in collaboration with the administration and the poor pursued the goals of rural development. This is an important aspect. That the, in the beginning, in the 1950s itself and from there onwards, the rural, set, rural leadership acted in collaboration with the administration and that collaboration, uh, that, uh, that administration and that rural leadership is considered to be the main agency for, the de for introduction of rural development programs in the country. It has, this rural leadership has given a progressive outlook to the people at large. This is an achievement of this democratic decentralization. The studies and reports conducted to examine the status of people's participation hinted that. What are those? Number one, there is structural inadequacy of the institutions, administrative efficiency, inefficiency and corruption, absence of conceptual clarity and lack of political will have been the main reasons behind the absence of meaningful people participation in the development process of the rural areas. This is an important aspect. No doubt attempts have been made for ensuring the participation and particularly the inadequacies or uh, the, we say the shortcomings attempts were made to remove those shortcomings through the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act. And the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act being, uh, we say, the instrumental in empowering the rural leadership and in empowering the rural, power, uh, rural masses and involve them in their development and decision making. No doubt that the spirit of the uh, this uh, 73rd Constitutional Amendment has, uh, has yet to be translated in reality, but we can say that uh, we say uh, that, but we can say that it has made the people to realize that they are also important in the political process of the country, maybe at the local level or maybe at the national level. This is the significant contribution which is being assessed or which is being perceived. No doubt there are so many things that we have to make certain, uh, certain uh, improvements in it. Financial st sustenance has to be given. We have to make planning as an important aspect. Uh, particularly in a time when planning commission is not there and uh, we, we have to empower the people so that they can take up the responsibility, they can understand what they want to do for themselves or for their progress. This is an important aspect but, uh, but this is again an issue which is a very broad one and which has to be discussed at length in, a, in separate, uh, at separate platform or in separate lectures, that is an important one. Then another dimension which is related to, uh, the, uh, to, to, to this rural development is the urban dimensions. What is this urban dimension? This is a new one. I am talking about these emerging issues which are relating to it. There are studies which indicate that there is a close relationship between urban issues and rural development nowadays. What are those? There are three such dimensions. Number one, urban development and rural change. 
that the classical paradigm is centered around the notion that agriculture saving labor force contribute to the urban industrial development. But reverse is also found to be true, means the urban development also pushes the rural development. If there is a development in the urban areas, it may generate employment opportunity in the surrounding areas which we call peri-urban areas or which we call hinterland of the urban areas. Generally, there have been so many studies and uh, we say uh, particularly uh, uh, that uh, there is a uh, planning unit, uh, we say, uh, in United Kingdom and, and uh, in LSC that has been uh, doing research on this area, peri-urban area, how the linkage is between rural urban and uh, in between the two, those areas are interlinking and generating the employment opportunity, what kind of employment opportunities there, the rural development is being influenced by them. If a big, big urban area is there, then around surrounding places are being benefited. There are some sort of economic source. There is a distinct economic, social, and political activities taking place there. And that indicates that urban development has its influence on the surrounding areas or the rural areas or on the rural development process that is taking place around that one. Then second is the non-agriculture rural employment. Urban area is generating non-agriculture, employment, and those are extensive in size. Those are larger and sustainable opportunities. The question is, many people are coming to cities for a regular employment. I am not saying those are very remunerative one, but what I am saying, those are very continuous, those are sustainable, and those are the size of the, that kind of employment is a quite large one. And the third thing is urban-rural linkage is approach. Hyper-urbanization has an undesirable implication. Means, as for example, Delhi is going to be bigger and bigger. It is very difficult to live in this kind of the city. Living cost is rising. In such a circumstances, if you adopt a strategy to develop small cities, with all amenities, then naturally the cost of living will also be reduced as well as the development of the people living there in that small city and around that cities that will induce the rural development process. That's why this is an important issue, although it has not been taken up in a right form in a right form in the means in the policy formulation by, by, the, by the government of India or by the state government, but this has to be taken as an important aspect of the rural development process. This is that one. Then land policy and land acquisition, again a very big area and it has to be dealt separately. But uh, we say there is another important issues, uh, those are relating to that one. Uh, that is differently abled persons and greening of rural development. These three issues, uh, two issues, differently able. The government of India has made it compulsory that all these schemes, projects, they will take care of the differently abled persons while extending the benefit or while uh, we say this is an important one. Similarly, there is uh, from 12th plan onwards, greening rural development issue has also been raised and there is a, that uh, when 75,000 crores of rupees are being invested on the rural development, in such a circumstances it becomes uh, compulsory that we take into account uh, the greening or we say a sustainable, uh, to ensure sustainable development, we take, uh, take into account that there must, there should not be any negative impact on the environment or as suggested by the various policies of the government. It should not be in contravention to that one. This is about the different issues, main issues. There are so many other issues also which are part of it and that's why rural development is a very big issues and that has to be understood if we really wanted to have economic progress in this country. Thank you very much. So um, uh, these are the issues which uh, need to be taken care of while framing the de uh, rural development yeah. uh, programs. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that the when, uh, any, any program like Manrega and others, uh, they are formed in isolation or uh, the holistic approach need to be taken while initiating any policy or programs? Uh, uh, if we uh, take uh, that Manrega is uh, formulated on the basis of experience 
uh, um, gathered from various implementation of the various uh, schemes. Mm -hmm. But uh, we say now it is somewhat a comprehensive program. The reason is if we can implement in a right manner, as you stated, in a holistic manner, naturally, then the res desired results can be obtained uh, with economy and efficiency. Okay, it means each policy should have been framed in uh, keeping bigger picture Big, in the bigger line. pictures. So it has to be integrated with the environment. Okay. So, well, friends, uh, with this word, we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture. And on your behalf, I thank Dr. Ajmer Singh Malik for giving such an insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much. Welcome.